All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Gnostic Church and Academy of Lord Jesus Christ. I am your teacher of the mysteries and preacher of the heart, Marty Leeds. And we're so glad that you are here this morning. And we're, we really appreciate everybody that shows up every Sunday. So thank you all for being here. We do service every Sunday at 9 a.m. Central Standard Time. That's what we do. That's why you're here. And today we're going to talk about, this is episode 76 of the Sunday services. And this is, Oh Man, Know Thyself. And this is really the core of Gnosticism. It's really all about um, understanding the self. Know thyself. And you shall know the universe as the universe and the gods as um, the old Gnostic credo goes. And we'll get into that today. <clears throat> Before we get going with all of this, though, instead of doing a prayer, I'm actually going to read a poem. And this poem is by Ralph Waldo Emerson, written in 1831. It's called Nathi Siatan, I think is how you say that. I'm not sure if I'm saying that inc correctly. But basically means know thyself. And so this is like a six-page poem, and I'm just going to read this because it's really good. And I've read part of this before, um, but I want to read the whole thing today, So, and hopefully I'll get through this. So, If thou canst bear strong meat of simple truth, if thou durst my words compare with what thou thinkest in my soul's free youth, then take this fact unto thy soul. God dwells in thee. It is no metaphor, no parable. It is unknown to thousands and to thee, yet there is God. He is in thy world. But thy world knows him not. He is the mighty heart from which life's varied pulses part. Clouded and shrouded, there doth sit the infinite embosomed in a man. And though and thou art stranger to thy guest, and knowest not what thou doth invest, the clouds that veil his life within are thy thick woven webs of sin, which his glory struggling through darkens to thine evil hue. Thy bear thyself, then bear thyself, O man, up to the scale encompassed of thy guest. Soul of thy soul, be great as doth beseem the ambassador who bears the royal presence where he goes. Give up to thy soul, let it have its way. It is, I tell thee, God himself, the selfsame one that rules the whole. Though he speaks through thee with a stifled voice and looks through thee shorn of his beams, but if thou listen to his voice, if thou obey the royal thought, it will grow clearer to thine ear, more, glor more glorious to thine eye. The clouds will burst that veil him now, and thou shalt see the Lord. Therefore be great, not proud, too great to be proud. Let not thine eyes rove, peep not in corners. Let thine eyes look straight before thee as befits the simplicity of power. And in, in, in thy closet carry state, filled with light, walk therein. And, as a king, would do no treason to his own empire, so do not thou to thine. This is the reason why thou dost recognize things now first revealed, because in thee resides the spirit that lives in all, and thou canst learn the laws of nature, because its author is latent in thy breast. Therefore, O happy youth, happy if thou dost know and love this truth, thou art unto thyself a law. And since the soul of things is in thee, thou needest nothing out of thee. The law, the gospel, and the providence, heaven, hell, the judgment, and the stores immeasurable of truth and good, all these thou must find within thy single mind or never find. Thou art the law. The gospel has no revelation of peace and hope until there is response from the deep chambers of thy mind thereto. The rest is straw. It can reveal no truth unknown before. The providence, thou art, th thou art thyself that doth dispense wealth to thy work, Want to thy sloth, glory to thy goodness, to neglect the moth. Thou sowest the wind, the whirlwind repeast, re repest. Thou payest the wages of thy own work through all the ages. The almighty energy within crowneth virtue, curseth sin. Virtue sees by its own light, stumbleth sin in self-made night. Who approves thee doing right? God in thee. Who condemns thee doing wrong? God in thee. Who punishes the evil deed? God in thee? What is thine evil need? Thy worse mind with error blind and more prone to evil, that is the greater hiding of the God within, the loss of peace, the terrible displeasure of this inmate, and the next and next the consequence more faintly as more distant wrought upon our outward fortunes, which decay with vice, with virtue rise. The self same God, by the self same law, makes the souls of angels glad and the souls of devils sad. See, there is nothing else but God wherever I look. All things ha hasten back to him. Light is but his shadow dim. Shall I ask wealth or power of God who gave an image of himself to be my soul? 
as well might swilling ocean ask a wave, or the starred firmament the dying coal, for that which is in me lives in the whole. And that's what we're going to discover today is the that pulse, that heartbeat within you is the presence of God. And we're going to come to know ourselves and know ourselves through the canon of mathematics, the language of mathematics. <clears throat> this is this so the 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 phrase know thyself is actually comes from allegedly comes from the Oracle of Delphi. And I'm just gonna do a little overview of what this is. This Basically, is allegedly an ancient sort of like mystery school, basically is what it was. And this was one of the key phrases. Know thyself is actually allegedly written on the entrance into this ancient sort of Pythagorean kind of mystery school. It says, heed these words. This is what was allegedly written right there. Heed these words. You who wish to probe the depths of nature, if you do not find within yourself that which you seek, neither will you find it outside. If you ignore the wonders of your own house, how do you expect to find other wonders? In you is hidden the treasure of treasures. Know thyself, and you will know the universe and the gods. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. So know thyself is a philosophical maxim which was inscribed upon the temple of Apollo, Apollo being the sun god, of course, in the ancient Greece, in the ancient Greek precinct of Delphi. Okay, and of course there was, uh, although the, the, there's, uh, there was seven sages of Greece, you know, the same sort of thing, sun gods, seven ages, Mystery school tradition, coming to understand the self is basically what? A microcosm of the macrocosm, as we'll see, is what we talk about all the time. And this is exactly what Know Thyself is really all about. Who says, man, know thyself? This was allegedly touted by, once again, the Oracle of Delphi and, you know, the, the ancient Greeks and things like that. Car uh, know thyself was carved into the stone at the entrance to Apollo's Temple of Delphi in Greece, as we just said. Socrates allegedly said this quite a bit. Um, it's been attributed to Pythagoras, of, ca of course. Man, know thyself, then thou shall know the universe and God. Once again, attributed to Pythagoras. So a lot of people allegedly, anyway, touted this sort of phrase. And it was all about, hey, man, you got, in order to understand who you are, where you are, the nature of God, your cosmology and everything, you first have to start with square one. And that's what Gnosticism is really all about. And then you will find out where God exists. In later writings on the subject, one common theme was that one could acquire knowledge of the self by studying the universe. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We are going to study today. We're going to show, we're going to study the outside. And we're going to see that the outside is right here. It's reflected. Everything that's out there is going to be reflected in here. And we're going to understand that through the language which God has given us. That's mathematics because that's put right in front of us. Um, this was often explained in the terms of the microcosm macrocosm analogy. And that's exactly what we talk about all the time. Um, the idea that the human being is structurally similar to the cosmos. He is. We are. Okay. Uh, the deepest structure of the self will be rec recognized as coextensive with the universe in general. So true self-knowledge, true self-knowledge will coincide with knowledge of the cosmic order. Amen. True self-knowledge will coincide with knowledge of of the cosmic order. This is what as above, so below is all about. Even in the Lord's Prayer, it even says, in earth as it is in heaven, in earth, in the earthen vessel that is you is what? The heaven. Okay, this is the Lord's Prayer. This is as above, so below. We've talked about this numerous, numerous times. Of course, this is what the zodiac man is. When every, every time that we go through every single one of those Bible chapters, right? And we look and be like, oh, this is Jesus's feet. It's Pisces. Oh, and here's Aries. And here's, you know, all that. This is all related to the Zodiac Man. And what is the Zodiac Man at its core? What is it? Is that the heavens reflect you? You reflect the heavens. Okay. This is, this is, I, I would say that this idea, this, this fundamental idea is 101 in mysticism and esotericism, right? But it's not just a, it's, and this is the important point in what we're going to show today, that this is not just a good philosophy. This is not just like, oh, as above, so below, that's so poetically nice and beautiful. No, no, that's all, you know, that it is, but uh, there, there's some math to it. There's a science to it. There has to be. Otherwise, what would be the point of investigating any of this, right? It has to come to some conclusion that we can actually put, you know, um, you know, pen to paper and say, yes, this is true. This is what we'll do today, okay? We are, in other words, we are a reflection of the greater order and we can prove it, okay? Genesis 127, so God created man in his own image. Notice image is the is the root of the word imagination. I think Bob Nodal was the, was the one, may you rest in peace, good man. He was one of the guys that actually, I think, mentioned that. It was a, a image is, is a reference to imagination. So when you talk about even the world and the, this experience that we exist in, it is very imaginative. But a lot of people talk about sort of a illusory, that sort of stuff. It does. It has this fleeting, passing sort of thing. That's because we exist in God's imagination. We are created in his image. We are created in a reflection of the grander order. 
in the image of God created he him, male and female created he him, Genesis 127. We are a proportion, right? As we're going to see today, after all the math that we show today, and some of this will be review, some of it's going to be brand new. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to show that you are in proportion to the thing, this creation, this material slash metaphysical realm that we're in. You can, f you can prove that we are proportion to it. Okay, which means when you recognize those sorts of things and you can actually put math to that, you realize that this is not a random thing. The idea that we're a bunch of monkeys that just evolved randomly and there's no, in, there's no intelligence behind the thing, making things into proportion, that can be roundly disproven by basic math. Unfortunately, we live in a time where people can't make those connections and it is what it is, we move on. We're gonna see we're in proportion to the entirety. That's what you are. Proportion etymologically means pro means for, um, and it means partio division related to pars apart, a piece, a share, a division. We are a part. We are a portion. We are a share. We are a. We are. You know. We are in in this self in this sense. God, the unity. You know, metaphorically speaking, divided himself, and when he divided each of himself, he put a, you know his part and portion in each of us, and we are proportioned to the whole thing. So for a portion. And that's exactly what we are. These proportions, these geometric and numeric relationships help us to allow, our, uh, um, I should say, allow us to understand our own consciousness. Um, let's see, uh, let me say this. This is Randall Carlson, Sacred Geometry International. Maybe he can say this better than I can. He probably can. These geometric relationships that we're going to find today when we come to know thyself and know the cosmic order, these geometric relationships are fundamental to basically the structure of our consciousness. And when, and this is what I've said for years, and once you come to know and actually intuit and understand this mathematics, you'll realize that you actually think that you form thoughts a lot of times in geometric relationships and things. And I'm, I'm not going to go too much into that, but this is basically what Carlson's saying here. These geometric relationships that we'll show today are fundamental to basically the structure of our consciousness. This is not something that we invented. We didn't invent any of this, as we'll see today. This is something that we discovered. This is something that's given to us by God Almighty directly. It's intrinsic within the fabric of nature itself. And the proportions that we find that govern nature are also the proportions that govern our consciousness. And so in effect, what Plato understood and what everybody I think understood about it that studied sacred geometry, and that's really what we'll be studying today, was that in effect it was a way of developing your consciousness as well. Studying these geometric relationships was a way to actually develop your consciousness and you know, ascend into higher levels of understanding. That's really what an awakening, all this sort of terminology is really all about, is understanding God more. That's it. Okay, and that's what we're going to do today. We, we talked enough about this as a super zoom in, but you know, this is, and let's go here, let's say this again. This is fractals, and this is really what a fractal says. Now, the fractal is a modern mathematical terminology of something that was clearly understood philosophically and mathematically in ages of old. But basically, all it's saying is that the big resembles the small, the small resembles the big. You go into the larger, and you know, you go out there and you find all the geometric and numeric relationships, and then you come down to here and you're like, oh, shit, they're here too. And that's what we're going to find today. And so this is really, you know, it's like, so that right there, that thing right there, that big old turtle, that's God you know, mathematically, metaphorically speaking, right? And you zoom in and you zoom in to the big and the big, and guess what? Then you're just going to find the small. And that's what it's all about. Now, once again, that's a nice idea. Fractals actually show that that's geometrically true, okay? <clears throat> this is also why we. it's important for us to understand the patterns of the heavens above our cosmology because what we're understanding when we develop our consciousness is understanding the Father more. And this is why, you know, we understand, we look at the etymology of father. Father is, of course, who begets a child. Who's the child? You. You're the child of God. Um, the father is, of course, it's Latin pater. It's the father in heaven. Fa you know, uh, father almighty God. Uh, of course, uh, pater is a root of pattern. Father, uh, pater, patron. Patron is a lord master, a patron, a lord master who protects, supports, or encourages. That's, of course, the father in heaven. See, father even tells you a doublet of pattern. Modern English word of patron, pattern, an outline, a plan, a model, an organized, an, excuse me, an original proposed for imitation, okay? So, under, once again, when we understand the patterns, 
of the Father in heaven, we understand that we have a relationship to those. We can actually prove that out. What, what, what does that do? It helps us understand God more, okay? And this is really what it's all about, that you are, we are the cosmic man. This is the anthropocosm. You know, and this, these are the things that, of course, you're not going to find in any school system. The only, the only place that you're going to find information such as this is in the mystery school tradition. And this is, once again, why we do what we do here at the Gnostic Church. Because you're not going to go into any, you know, you're, you're not going to go down to, um, you know, your, your local junior high school and they're going to be teaching you about phi and phi and, and everything like that. They're just not going to do it, you know. They're also going to tell you to run a spinning ball, and we'll get to that in just a second. So this is the monad, once again. This is the monad. The spark within, recognized, right? Reflective of the God above. This is what we talked about again and again and again and again, and this is exactly what the Bible is teaching, okay? So with all of that said, the Oracle of Delphi, right? This is the Know Thyself. Allegedly, this is where it comes from, the Oracle of Delphi. It's the center of the ancient world, of course, right? The Temple of Apollo. Apollo is, of course, the sun god. And this was this oracle. She, there was this woman. There was. Uh, I'm just going to go over this real quick, and then I'm just going to show you that there's a bunch of this stuff that is it's right up in the cosmos. Okay, all of these ancient stories. When you actually put the fa the father, the pattern, the patron, the patterns of the heavenly father, right, of our sky, onto these old myths, they start making sense. You can actually say, "Oh, look, there's a dragon. Oh, look, there's a you know, there's a boar running around a mountain." You can just you know, it's like you can find out where these things come from. They're upstairs. Okay, so this is. The Oracle of Delphi, her name was Pythia, and she sat on a tripod. And it was really, it was it was very distinct that she sat on a tripod, and you can see. And there's all this story about how she would, there would be this mist that would come up. And, you know, I'm not going to go into this too much because we're actually going to focus on the math today. But I'll just, you know, just so we have some background. Pythia was the name of the high priestess at the Temple of Apollo at Delphi. She specifically served as its oracle and was known as the Oracle of Delphi. Um, the name Pythia is derived from Pytho, of course, Python, snake, serpent, of course. Where, why? Well, I wonder where we're dealing with right now, right? Which in myth was originally the name of Delphi, okay? And so um, basically, and this is here, I'm just going to read this. Delphi was considered the navel of the world. Okay, here's just some key points, and then I'll just show you the star patterns here. Delphi was the navel of the world. According to Zeus, the, the, uh, according to Greek mythology, Zeus sent two eagles from the top of Mount Olympus, there's a big mountain and there's two eagles, pay attention, out into the world to find the center of Mother Earth. So there's a big mountain, there's two eagles, they're trying to find the center of Earth. One of the eagles headed west and the other headed east. Okay, well this is, this is your Delphi in the sky. Okay, this is the Oracle of Delphi in the sky. Who are the eagles? First off, who, what's Mount Olympus? I'm just going to show. I'm just going to show you this, and then we'll move on to math and all this other stuff. But just so you, everything that we're showing in the Bible, in other words, when you say, "Hey, there's a correlate to the constellations above," this is what I'm saying. Going to the Greek stuff, you're going to see the same thing. Going to the Norse stuff, you'll see the same thing. Going to the Egyptian stuff, you'll see the same thing. It's all based on this. Okay, they didn't just make this stuff up. <clears throat> Who are the eagles that flew east and west? Well, that's Aquila, which is an eagle, and what's the um, Lyra, which is an eagle holding a lyre, which Vega actually is the eagle head of an eagle okay what's delphi what's the constellation right there it's delphinus right we've actually talked about this before what is lyra lyra um the constellation right there it's actually covered by the thing that says tripod there but lyra vega vega that's the eagle what what did we just figure that out was that was orpheus orpheus okay so here you have all of these pieces there's your two eagles one is literally flying this way and the other one's flying this way as if east and west they're, they're close to Mount Olympus, which is in the center of the earth, as it says. What's, what's, this, what's the mountain that we always talk about? Well, it's right there. That's in the center. That's Mount Olympus. And there's the two eagles. What's the tripod? It's the summer triangle. You know how we just dealt with the winter hexagon? Now we're dealing with what? The summer triangle. And this Pythia, right, that, that, that was named after, um, slayed a dragon, that sort of thing. And what's right there? What's the python? It's Draco. Okay, so the tripod, you've got the summer triangle, you've got Draco, the Pythia, you've got Mount Olympus, and you've got two eagles. And then you even have the constellation Delphinus, which is known as Job's coffin, which is what's a coffin? It's death and resurrection. All of this stuff is upstairs. Okay, so, um, so I just wanted to point that out, and then now let's get into some math, okay? So 
this whole thing, this whole story that we get of this Greek mythology of this woman and you know, breathed in these fumes and gave some oracle and killed a serpent, all this other stuff, right? Ultimately, it's, to, it's all there to tell you about one thing. What is it? Know thyself. And when you come to know thyself, you realize that you are designed off the heavens. You are designed perfectly according to the laws of the cosmic laws that, that God has put forward, okay? First thing we're going to do here, we're not going to do much English Gematria today. I just wanted to show this. You're designed. You are designed. I mean, this is something I made a long time ago. But, you know, first and foremost, we're going to look at our hands. Many people know this, but 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14, and 14 times 2 is 28, okay? And we're going to see that your hands actually show in numerous, numerous ways directly how you're related to the patterns of those celestial objects above, okay? And 28 will be a number that we'll be focusing on your hands, okay? And of course, design equals 28 in English Gematria. I thought that was pretty cool. So, your hands give you Kabbalah, as we know. It gives you the numbers, the base 10 system, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, or 1 through 10. And you can say it either way. Now, we use this number system all the time, but we never think, until you actually go and study it, you know, like I had done for many, many years, you don't really even realize like how profound that system is until you actually go and think about it and start, you know, at looking at the attributes and the qualities and the characteristics of these numbers and how they interact with one another and how they're right in front of you as above and so below. We'll get into that. You don't really realize how profound this system is until you actually start working with it and learning it. And this is why our school systems have done everything in their power to make us hate math because they don't want us to actually know cosmic divine truth. They don't want us knowing the holy sciences, do they? No, they don't want us knowing what's right in front of us. This comes from Laplace. He's a French uh, mathematician and he said this. This was a guy that recognized how profound the base 10 system is or Kabbalah is. The ingenious method of expressing every possible number using a set of 10 symbols, each symbol having a place value and an absolute value, emerged in India, allegedly. The idea seems so simple nowadays that its significance and profound importance is no longer appreciated. We use it every single day and we don't even think about like how profound it is that we have this metaphysical, supernatural language that's literally emanating out of us materially in front of us and we never even think about it. Its simplicity lies in the way it facilitated calculation and placed arithmetic foremost amongst useful inventions. Okay, so we don't think about how important the fact is is that how many things in our world are based on a number system that's put right in front of us, zero through nine, and we don't even think about it. As I've said numerous, numerous times, name one science that you can do. Maybe there's some soft sciences like psychology and stuff, but even if you get to there, you're going to be dealing with math, I guarantee it. Name any science that you can do that doesn't at some point utilize math. There aren't any. Once again, even if you get into psychology, you get into like Jungian shit and you get like dream analysis, you'll get a book and you'll be like, why is all these circles and squares? I don't understand why these people are dreaming mandalas and then drawing, you know? It's like... Same sort of thing. You'll you know it'll come back. What what you realize is that is that knowledge of zero through nine, one through ten isn't something that was invented. Just like Randall Carlson said, it was given to humanity. It was discovered. Okay, this is something that's intrinsic, inherent within the creation itself. It's put right in front of you, and it's unbelievably profound. And the knowledge of how profound this is and how it relates to everything in our world is given to people. Okay, this is, um, and I'm going to do a whole live stream called my own Kabbalistic receptions or something like that. Basically talking about, it. there's a bunch of discoveries or whatever that Marty Leeds made that I didn't freaking make. It was just like all of a sudden, oh, there it is, you know, kind of thing. It was revealed. There's no other way to say it. I certainly can't take credit for it. Kabbalah teaches that our individual lives reflect a universal process. They do. The Kabbalist teaches that we are meant to receive endless blessings from the Creator. We are. In fact, the word Kabbalah means to receive, and that's exactly what we seek. We seek that reception, that gift, right from God. Okay? Once again, I'm just going to mention this. Like, you know, Laplace here just said, he's like, look, this is an ingenious method of expressing every number with just basic 10 digits, right? These are your 10 emanations of God. 
when we actually look at those, and I'm just going to set this up so we can actually get into the nitty gritty here. I know this is a review for some people, but you know, what are numbers? They're supernatural. They're metaphysical. They have inherent qualities. They're inherent attributes. They're ordered. They're axiomatic. They're universal. They're emanations from God. They're what we call the angels, that the angelic hierarchy, the divine print. They're divine principles of design, and it's you. It's an, it's an alphabet. It's it's a way of communicating. A, a bunch of information, and you're giving a numeric alphabet, and that's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and it's put right in front of you. Now, one of the things that got me um, early on was this thing called Kabbalistic reduction, right? And this is, or it's called digital rooting Pythagorean addition, that sort of thing, right? Now, this is something that's poo pooed in modern mathematics. And um, when I discovered this, I was like, well, why? Why is it poo pooed? So digital rooting is just basically taking, and many people know this, pay, taking a number like 32 and you reduce it down to 5. That's it. So 32, therefore, relates to 5 in some way, right? Not quantitatively, of course, but qualitatively. Okay. Now, this is something that actually happens on your fingers, right? This is something that, Kabbalistic reduction is something that's completely, as far as I know, modern math is generally sees as like, you know, goof math or like recreational math, that sort of thing. It's right on your hands. It's right on your hands. You know, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. You have 1 and 4. 14 phalanges. 14 phalanges on your hands. And what's 1 plus 4? It's 5. Okay? So if 1 plus 4 is 5. This That Kabbalist reduction is put right on your hands. And there's like heap loads of like hoity-toity like university level mathematicians are like, that's not a valid mathematical. Okay. Kabbalah tells you otherwise. You, you're the, your own hands that God has given you tell you otherwise. So which one are you going to go with? The university professors, Marty Leeds, or God? I would go with God if I were you. Okay. Another thing when we understand, so this is, this is all about knowing thyself. It's looking at thyself. And the first thing you, we recognize is like, why are we looking at our hands? Well, because God has designed us specifically to actually point out these segmented things on our body. Not that difficult when you think about it. It's like okay, numbering by fingers and toes, finger signs and number words. Apart from teeth, and we'll get into this in just a second, we'll get into the teeth, fingers and toes are the only parts of the body which man possess in any abundance. They are supplementary quantities that he has always conveniently, quote unquote, on hand. These supplementary quantities, we have, as we'll see, we have a mathematical template, a mathematical um you know, multiplication table that's put right in front of us. And we always have them on hand. And this is really, besides our teeth, the only parts of our body, the fingers and toes, are the only parts of our body that are segmented in this way. Well, why are they segmented? Because God wants us to count them. That's why he put them so right in front of us. Okay? It doesn't matter which language you speak, what religion you come from, right? If you believe in, you know, Muhammad or Christ or whatever, it doesn't matter. This is put what's put right in front of you. God is saying, know thyself. I segmented these things and put them right in front of you because at some point I want you to wake up and say, hey, why did I do that? So bef before we get into all the hands, let's look at just some of the basic maths of, of the, the teeth. Okay, so as he says here, hey, we'll get into lots of the hands as we always do, but let's look at the teeth right now. So apart from teeth, fingers and toes are the only parts of the body which man possesses in any abundance. Okay, well, let's look at those teeth. Okay. First off, your temper you get two sets of teeth. You get your you know, your child's teeth, whatever, your temporary teeth, and you get your adult teeth, your permanent teeth, right? Your temporary teeth are twenty. Okay? That's the first thing you get. And then those fall out and then you get thirty two. Okay. Well, first off, what's the first twenty? Twenty is a base uh, it's a base 20 system. The number 20 would be a reference to a vigesimal system or a base twenty system, zero through nineteen. That's exactly what you have here. So the first set of teeth you get, top and bottom, actually reflect your top and bottom toes and, and fingers. Okay? 10 up there, 10 down there, 10 up there, 10 up here, 10 down there. Okay, then those fall out. Then what do you get? You get 32. Okay. <clears throat> we'll add those together in just, in just a second, but let's look at the number 32. Let's just forget about, doesn't matter what... I, what kind of worldview you look at this through, this is just how 32 works. This is just the divisors of 32. This is not gematria. It's not numerology. There's the divisors of 32. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and 32. Do you know what that is? 
These, this is just the number of teeth that God has given you in your pie hole. Because this is called your pie, your mouth. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and 32. Do you know what those are? That's a doubling pattern. Naturally, your teeth expressed to you by just studying the number that God has put in your mouth has given you a doubling pattern. 1 plus 1 is 2. 2 plus 2 is 4. 4 plus 4 is 8. 8 plus 8 is 16. 16 plus 16 is 32. Do you know what that is? Do you know what that doubling pattern is? It's the pattern in which cells divide to actually create the entirety of you. In my meiosis and mitosis, that's the doubling pattern. The doubling pattern which actually takes the cells, doubles them and doubles them again and doubles them again. It follows a pattern in order to ultimately create the image of God that is you. That doubling pattern is found in your teeth. And all you have to do is what? Know thyself. Look at your teeth. Study them. Why do I have 32? What does, what does 32 mean? Okay. Christ equals 32 in English gematria. Why? There's numerous, 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 numerous reasons, as we know. Doubling pattern in 32, inherent, intrinsic in 32, just being one of them. Now you have what? Let's look at our let's look at our feet. Okay. Oh, let me let's let's go back here. 20 temporary teeth and then 32 permanent teeth. 20 plus 32 is what? 52. How many weeks in the year are there? There it's based on seven, by the way. A week is based on seven days, as we know. How many weeks in the year? 52. So once again, ultimately what we're saying when we know thyself is that we're going to reflect the grander cosmic order, okay? So when we look at ourselves, then we should be able to find numbers that reflect the grander cosmic order. Do we dictate, in this sense, do we dictate the 365 days of the sun? No, no, we don't. We don't do that, right? God decides that. And ultimately, what we're going to see is that the way to map and track that is the same. It, all we have to do is look to ourselves. And I'll show you multiple, multiple ways in which to do this. Temporary teeth, 20. Permanent teeth, 32. That's 52 weeks of the year. This is the number of bones in your feet. You have 26 bones in your feet. Same number of phalanges as we'll see. 26 bones in the left, 26 in the right, and you have 52. So your teeth tell us about this number. And your feet tell us about this number. Okay? Those, as we know, I'm, I'm just gonna show this and then we'll get into we'll get into the hands a bit, okay? <clears throat> when we when we map time, we map it through the sun. Now we can map a, a lunar calendar and a, a you know a Saturnian calendar and a Venus calendar and the you know, all of that sort of stuff, yes. But ultimately all the time is based on what? The rising and setting of the sun. That's how we dictate the day. Okay? This is why there's all these sun god myths, because ultimately your portal into understanding cosmic order is through what? The sun. The sun. Okay? What does the sun do? Ultimately gives us that equinox 12 hours a day, 12 hours a night. We ultimately understand that we map and track the sun by 24. Did the ancient elders just come up with this by just like, oh, we're just going to pick 24? As we're going to see, no. How did they figure out to map and track the sun through a 24-hour day? They came to know thyself. That's how they figured it out. And then they should then they knew the universe and the gods. Look at your ribs. 12 here and 12, 12 here, okay? What is that total? 24. Once again, how many hours in the day? 24. And we'll we'll see that right on our hands. This is something, once again, review, I know, but that's okay. That's okay. We don't mind a little review here. When we talk about seven days of the week, well, where do we come up with that? Where do we why do why do we pick seven? 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 is 28. It's right in front of you. It's right in front of you. So there's 52 weeks based on 7 days a year. Why 7? Know thyself. Know what's right in front of you. I just want to show this. Um, you know, there's another... So, okay, so we understand 52 weeks of the year or 7 days of the week, that sort of stuff. Okay, now, why do we use... This is asked a lot. Why do we use 360 for the degrees of a circle and a square. Why is that something? Well, once again, did we just pick that, did our ancient ancestors just pick that randomly? No, no, not at all. They came to know thyself. Adding one through seven equals 28. Multiplying those same numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, equals 5,040. The division of those two numbers, which are, once again, that triangulation, because that's what you do when you, tri when you triangulate. One, two, three, four, Five, 
six, seven. You just created a natural triangle, okay? Take those numbers, add them, take those numbers, multiply them, divide through them, and what do you get? Naturally, 180. The trinity is on your hands, okay? Naturally. So we say, well, where do we get the 100 degrees of a triangle? And why, why do we use 360 for a circle? And why for a square? Those basic numbers are put, they're literally crafted right on you, is what we'll see. We've also talked about this when we did the geometry of good thinking. <clears throat> the entire number line, all of this, 0 through 9, is based on that 180 that's put on your hands. So the degrees is what? The degrees of the triangle is what? 180. Then you go up to, so that's th so 0, 1, 2, really no geometry yet. There's only 3. When you get to that 3, that's your 180. You walk up to 4, add 180, get 360. Walk up to 5, add 180. That holy trinity. You get to 540, add 180, you get to 6, it's 720, add 180, you get to 7, it's 900, you add 180, you get to 8, it's 1080, you add 180, it gets to 9, it's 1260. That is all, where do we get those numbers? You know, people would say that, oh, we just, didn't, we just decided that. No, we didn't. No, we didn't. Ancient cultures, whoever has passed this information on, came to know themselves by looking at themselves. Look at that, looking at the math that is provided right in front of them. Segmented sections, okay? <clears throat> All of these questions about, like, why 24 hours a day? Why 180 degrees for a triangle? Why 360 for a circle and square? Why 7? Why 52 weeks? All of that stuff is literally right on you. The basic math to find all of it has been given to you, okay? When we talk about multiplying 1 through 7, adding 1 through 7, you get the basic division between those numbers which are placed right on your hands. What do you get? 180. 180, which means now there's gematria to this as well. We're not going to show that today. I've showed that before. Tons of gematria in multiple languages, okay? And so you have 180 here naturally intrinsic. It doesn't matter what language you speak, where you come from, what you believe. It doesn't matter because God doesn't care about any of that shit. God cares about truth and wants you to care about truth. You put a, you got 180 here. You grab somebody else's hands. What do you have? 180. Okay, grab another person's hands. What do you have? It was 180 and 360. And then we'll get, oh, I'll grab another person's hands. What do you have? Oh, you got 540 now. And then you grab another. What do you get? Oh, you, you just, oh, it keeps going, right? Keeps going 720 and 900 and 1080 and 1260. Every time you grab hands with another naturally intrinsic within the mathematics that God has given you on your hands. <clears throat> the divisors, once again, naturally, this is just how God made the number 360. The number 360 naturally has 24 divisors. The circle being a figure which returns into itself and having therefore neither beginning nor end has been adopted in the symbology of all countries and times as a symbol sometimes of the universe and sometimes eternity. I believe Manly Palmer Hall said that. The 360 degrees of the circle is assuredly recognized for its inherent economy, ease, and simplicity. And this brilliant circular image is burned into our consciousness every single day in the sun. The circle is burned into our consciousness every single day in the sun. This, this, the number 360 has 24 divisors, perfectly equating to the 24 hours of one solar revolution. So when we say, hey, why did, why did the ancient ancestors divide, first off, come to the number 360 in the first place? They knew thyself. They counted what was literally right in front of their hands. They, they grabbed hands in unity and be like, oh, geez, look at that, 360. Then they went to the number 360 itself, and 360 naturally has 24 divisors. How many hours in the day? 24. Why? Intrinsic, inherent. When we come to understand these things, that, that, that's, a, that's something that's universal. Then what, what does that allow us to understand? The natural cosmic order. And what does that allow us to do? Expand our consciousness. Open up to realize, oh, it's, it's one thing to just say, yes, this place is ordered. There's an order to this place, and there's a fatherly heaven, you know, heavenly father up there, and he's, you know, it's one thing to say that. It's one thing to say it's a nice philosophy as above and so below. It's another thing to put the pen to the paper and find the actual math that God has given right in front of us. Those are two different things. When we're scientists, we seek proof. I don't want conjecture. I don't want opinion. I don't want, oh, did you hear what the theory, the, the one, the, 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 who cares? I don't care. I want proof. 
God has given us that roof right in front of our hands. I'm just going to show this quick. There's a multiplication table on your hands as well. Once again, that's just knowing thyself. You know? And that actually tells you about the number nine as well, which we could talk about for days. You know, this, um, is, you know uh, this would be zero and nine at the top, so I'm not multiplying anything. What do you got? Nine here and then zero here. You go to the next one, what do you got? You got one finger here and then eight fingers here. You just multiply one, two, you know, three. What do you got? Three times nine is 27, you can see there. <sighs> really easily taught you know a you know this is what people should be teaching their children and of course the school systems are not that phalan the phalanges of your hands once again uh, all based on seven is the same as your hands and your feet okay the the, the mathematical pattern now Let's talk about the sun. We already talked about, hey, why 360? Why 180? Why 360? Why are we using those numbers? Why 24? Okay, once again, we talked about the 12 ribs here and the 12 ribs here, right? This is your this is your four fingers put right in front of you, separated naturally from your thumb, right? Okay, so there's your thumb. Here's your four fingers. They're separated. There's, you got these, you know, these little claws here, right? The opposable thumbs kind of thing. These four fingers, when you put them on the horizon, if you extend your hand out and you put it on the horizon like that, you can actually map the hour of the sun. So that pattern that the sun takes is a twenty, you know, twenty-four hours in a day, right? Well, you can map each hour with your hand, okay? And as you can see right there, once again, I've showed this before, and this is why they call this the hands of the clock, of course, right? This is your hands of the clock. So put it, in the, you know, if you. Uh, you know, find a place where you can actually find the horizon, right? Stand there, put your arm out like this, and you can actually map. Oh, let's, let's see. If we know the sun was going to rise at 6 o'clock on the dot this morning, well, that means if the sun is up, that's 7, and then 8, and 9, and 10, and 11, and 12, okay? Not only that, not only that, but the divisions of that hour are given on each finger. 15 minutes, 15 minutes, 15 minutes, 1 hour. 15, half hour, 45, 1 hour. Okay? So, and this is, once again, there's your hands of the clock. 15, 30, 45, 60. 15, 30, 45, 60, etc. Okay? So, so there, so, um, and I'll get to this in just a second, but when we say like, okay, so the ancient, this is what we're told anyway, like the ancient Sumerians gave us the sexagesimal system, the base 60 system, because they just decided that or something. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. That was not, that was not a decision. That was something that was discovered. It wasn't, it wasn't invented. It wasn't, it wasn't like, let's just decide on this. No, it was absolutely intrinsic within the, within the structure of your proportion to the sun which we don't even know what that thing is, a metaphysical object as far as we're as far as we're concerned. You're in complete proportion to that. And in order to find out how to base the sex, you know, base 60 system, 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes an hour, where did they find that? It's literally put right in front of you. And there's no question about it. Not only that, it's not just the sun that you can measure. You can measure, of course, the entire sky with your hand. This is something that comes from like, I mean, and this is, this is information too, that you can find in a lot of different places. Like so, certain like Boy Scout troops will teach this or like, you know, like some astronomy courses and stuff will teach this, but they don't put it all together to show it's like, Hey, what, what does that say about you? What does that say about how you're proportioned to the whole thing? What does that say about you being the anthropocosm? So against, you know, not measuring the sun here, now you're against the firmament, right? So you're proportioning yourself to the firmament. One finger length is what? It's roughly one degree. Okay, you can see three fingers is, you know, roughly five. A, a fist is roughly ten. You know, you, you get the, the devil's horns there. You get 15 degrees, if you will, sort of thing. 25 degrees, and that's, of course, on, you know. So in, in, in this sense, if you, one finger length away from you to the horizon one finger length is one degree which means what just naturally with the mathematics that you're given with everything else the hands and all of that it would be one two three four five, 360 once again extracted directly from not some great holy book that we had to dust off and find all the sacred knowledge no it's literally right in front of you okay 
This, um, once again, when we find out, oh, the Trinity, that 180 is naturally on your hands. We found that. Multiply through 7, add through 7. Simple division between the two gives you, what, 180. Your entire number line is based on that. And then we say, where does this Trinity thing come from? It was, it was given by revelation from these, you know, these ancient bishops. And, they came, and it was like, no, I, I think the revelation came right in front of them. They were like, oh, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Oh, oh. We talked about the Trinity. 100, 180 being a trin trinity, right? Um, when you look at 360 and divide that by 3, what do you have? 120, and that's a trine. 120 is a trine. Once again, a reference to what? A third. A reference to three. That's exactly what your hands are. Okay? When you realize that these are 15-minute segments, 15, 15, 15, 15, right? That's 60, which means both of your hands give you 60 and 60, which is what? 120. What's 120? It's the, it's the, it's the doctrine of Jesus. It's the, it's, well, here. It's the doctrine of Jesus. A trine is the a trine is a an astrological term, by the way. A trine is an astrological term, and that's exactly what you're referencing to in this sense, the firmament or the or the sun. Lord Jesus Christ, four letters, five letters, six letters. Four times five times six is one twenty. What do the properties inherently, the natural properties of one twenty give us? Three sixty. That's right on your hands. So multiple ways in which you can extract directly, directly, this base number 360. Not something made up by a bunch of old ancient wizards and things. Um, let's look at this. The sexagesimal system is the number 0 through 59, right? And so then we, and then this is why, this is one of the reasons I fell in love with and, you know, why we promote these is this is your 59 beads of your Christian rosary, right? So all of those things, that base 60 system, it's right on your hands, multiple ways in which you could find it. It's how you map and track the sun. It shows that you're proportioned to the firmament. It shows that you're proportioned to the sun, that you're proportioned to the entire cosmos. That base number 0 through 59 is a sexagesimal system, and that's what's on the rosary. And it's the son of God. And there's his equinoxes and his solstices, and how he resides within you, and how he died and resurrected, and now he lives forever, etc., etc. So that's all a reference to that. This thing here, this this rosary, is trying to tell you about the structure of the cosmos, of time itself, and how you're proportioned to it all. Like this. Like, who'd have thunk, huh? Who'd have thunk? So people wonder why we do the rosaries. Um, cause we know what they mean. So look at the Zodiac. Once again, the Zodiac, the Zodiac is a 16 degree belt. Okay. Once again, this is roughly, we're, you know, it's approximately speaking, right? There's, by the way, um, in the, in the material realm, all flows, everything is constantly in motion and in fluidity and things like that. So you're not going to find a stasis, a perfect measurement. You're not going to find pi perfectly, right? You're not going to find phi perfectly. That's not how it works down here, right? But we're given these whole numbers so that we can understand these basic axioms, right? Um, axiomatic relationship, ge geometric and numeric relationships that show us proportion, okay, is what I mean. So there's your the zodiac, right, which is an eight, a 16 degree belt, which means roughly, roughly speaking, right, if it's one degree on the horizon, you could basically put four fingers out, roughly four fingers, you go like this, you got the bottom of your zodiac, you go like this, put your hands out, you got your bottom of your zodiac, you got your top of your zodiac. So your hand's breath your hands width can actually measure the, the the belt in which those celestial objects fly around and fly through, if you will. All on your hands. The zodiac itself is on those fingers that you use to map and track the sun. The zodiac is separated into quadrants. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Earth, air, water, fire, earth, air, water, fire, earth, air, water, fire, right? And then it's a cardinal fix mutable, cardinal fix mutable, cardinal fix mutable, cardinal fix mutable. That's right on the divisions of your hands. You know, there's your one quadrant, there's your two, there's your three, there's your four. Okay. Now, those fingers, think about this. All of that, 
Oh, now we'll get into this. This will be uh, this will be pretty pretty interesting. When you when you look at your hands and once again know thyself, come to understand thyself and how perfect you were created. Every every finger, every phalange here in your finger, phalange is your little segments right there, as we know, right? When you put that onto the horizon and then you actually count, what do you have? It's five minutes. So you know, no, I'm sorry. Five minutes. 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 And then it's on a five. It's, it's a lot of fives. Okay. So you got five here and then there's counting fives there. And then the 15 minutes is like, well, of course, divisible by three, obviously. And then it's all, but you know, and then it's like five and then five and then five. And then, five. And then you look down and you have five, five. There's a lot of fives. It's a lot of fives. Why? Once again, <clears throat> who determines phi? Let's draw a perfect pentagram. This is, shows the transcendence of the knowledge that is behind things like the Holy Bible, by the way, and behind all of these great traditions, right? Who owns phi? Who owns the number five? Who owns the pentagram? Who owns the sun? It's always God. Your answer is always God, by the way. It's not, it's not a trick question at all. It's just like saying, so who created this relationship called phi that we know so much about, that we understand as a fingerprint of God? that we've talked numerous, numerous times about. Where do we find this relationship? This 1 to 0.618, this 1 to 1 1.618, where do we find it? We find it in the perfect pentagram, the number 5. So all, all we have to do, all God wanted us to do, is do a little bit of geometry, measure that, and then find it everywhere. In inanimate, inanimate objects on you. That we'll, I mean, we've talked about this numerous, numerous times. All the places that you can uncover this fingerprint of God, this design signature within creation. So God's like, where do you want to find this this proof that there's design here? Well, you got to look at the number five. And then where did he put that? It's like right here, and then right here, and then down there, and then down there. And then every time that you go to measure that sun on the horizon, what do you got? Well, five minutes here, and then five here, and then five here, five, 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 five. Oh, Jesus, that's a lot of fives. Apparently, God is throwing five in your face a lot. Of course, phi is this proportion. We see it all over the human body. We've covered this enough times, you know, wrist to elbow, elbow to the tip of your fingers, roughly 1.6, you know, 1 to 1 point, or 0.618, you know, that proportion. You know, your finger here. There's all these your cochlear of your ear. We've talked numerous times about this, right? There's the, you know, this golden mean, golden spiral, golden, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, the human body proportioned on it. Even five extends, extensions from the torso, the head, the two arms, the two legs, you know. So you're even built in this sort of like pentagonal sort of formation, right? And then you wonder why Moses, the, the Pentateuch, penta meaning five, Includes the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I like wonder why Moses, Moses had his great revelation and he wrote five books. I wonder why. I, w I wonder why. Because God was literally just speaking directly to some old Jew. Well, actually, I think God actually is ready and willing to speak to whoever wants to actually listen to him. And he speaks all the time in front of us. His knowledge, his wisdom, and his knowledge, and or and to under, understand his order and his design and your relationship to it, has always been right in front of you. It's never left you, because that's how God works. That number five, by the way, tells there's a message in that number five, and we've covered this numerous times. What is that message? Well, it's it's a, it's a really good. It's a it's the same message that we're actually going to find in the triangle. Same message that you'll find in the triangle. Remember, we did that whole trying thing and then we found the triangle right here and then that person has a triangle 180 and we grab hands and we got 360 that whole thing right the triangle as we're going to find is balance perfected in form and that's what the number five is it's a balance it's a, it's a it's a balance the number five is a balance between the one and the nine the heavy nine and the light one if you will okay this whole thing called phi is um given the term the golden mean the golden mean, the golden proportion. Do you know what mean means? Golden means colored or shining like gold. It, of course, gold in the archaic or the like, sim, or the, the the spiritual sense, gold means uh, incorruptible. It means divine truth is really what gold, gold means, right? It's sort of the same because it's related to light. Same symbolism of light, right? Golden mean mean is what? It's uh, the value obtained by dividing the sum of several quantities by their number. It's an average. 
It's a condition, a quality, or a course of action equally removed from two opposite extremes. So there's an opposite extreme. There's one over here, and then there's a nine over here. And the five, that mean, is right in the, is right in the balance, is right in the center of it. Um, equally far from two extremes, calculated as a mean, an average. It's, it's the balance between the two extremes. And that's exactly, that's exactly what it is. And this balance is given all over you. It's like here and here and then on your feet and then on your torso and then all even when you're mapping time. It's like five, 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 five. Okay, we get it. Jesus, you didn't have to put it on her body like 20 different times. But he did. God did because he knows what he's doing. Okay, so now let's look at our hands once more. Let's look at our hands once more and say, hey, there's a bunch more math that's going to relate to the stars. It's going to relate to the patterns, those fatherly patterns in heaven that give us cycles and specific, you know, mathematics. So, there is the 14 phalanges of one hand. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 13, 14, excuse me. You add 1 through 14, it equals 105. There's your two hands, right? And your two hands actually, um, if you have 105 and 105, it would equal 210, okay? So there's the top one shows you adding the 14 phalanges of your hands equal 105. Well, if you have 105 and 105, you'd have 210. You can actually find this number 210 by adding 1 through 20. Does everybody see that? So the top shows you we're just triangulating the 14 phalanges of your left hand or right hand. It doesn't matter. 105. If you did that twice, you'd have 210. Where do we find the number 210? Well, you use that triangle once again and you triangulate up to the number 20. Where did we find the number 20? Where did we find the number 20? Number one, God, the first thing God gave it in our teeth, 10 up here and 10 down there. And then God also gives 10 up here and 10 down there. You got 10 and 10, 20. You got 10 and 10, 20. And then we want to count the actual 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, equals 105. And 105 equals 210. And where do we find the 210? There it is. Adding 1 through 20. All of these things, your teeth and your hands and the, in the you know, all, as we're going to see, this, the moon and the sun, all of it are interrelated because, of course, God is unified and, and works throughout all things. This is what the word is. I don't think we're going to quibble about that on this channel. So let's look at those two numbers, 105 and 210, that God has given every single human being, right? Who has a pair of hands. And if somebody is born without a pair of hands, you know that, you know, it's like, well, they don't have hands. So that's the, one of the first things you notice because the template is supposed to have hands, right? So anyway, number 105, let's just go once again to the divisors. Doesn't matter if you're Chinese or if you're atheist or you're agnostic or you're Hindu, or maybe you're like, you know, up in the, 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 the hills of some like Himalayan mountains or Mongolia or some shit, and you have some crazy worldview. Doesn't matter what you think. This is facts. This is not indisputable. Let's just look at the number 105 and its divisors. 1, 3, 5, 7, 15, 21, 35, 105. Adding 1 through 14, 105. We're just looking at its divisors. What is that? The sum of the divisors is what? 192. Do you know what that is? It's half a lunar year. It's half a lunar year. 13 months of the moon. 29.53 days. This is a synodic lunar month. I believe it's a synodic lunar month. 13 times 29.53 is 384. 384 divided by 2 is what? 192. It, that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. I'm going to look at the divisors and then we're going to find a number that we relate directly to the moon. The lunar, well, let's get rid of this. Okay, so that's 105. So that's that one hand. Okay, now let's count both hands. 105 plus 105 equals 210. Or we'll just add up to 20, 210. Either way, both of those numbers have been given to us multiple times in the human body. 105 plus 105 equals 210. Let's look at the divisors of 210. There they are. 1, 2, 3, 5, 6. You can count them yourself. The sum of the divisors equal what? 576. Do you know what 576 is? F 57, well, let's take this. 576 divided by 192, which is the number we just got from the other 105, equals 3. 
which is once again the Trinity. Or we can say it like this. That's a year and a half. Or that would be, yeah, that'd be, um, yeah, a, a, be a year and a half of the moon. 192 times 3. So in other words, 384, 13 months, take another six months, on t or six and a half months or whatever on top of that, what do you have? 576. 192 times 3, in other words, is what I'm saying. So, all and that's a lunar month. This, and I'll, and I'll show that in just a second. That's 29.53 synodic lunar month times the 13 months is 384. That number is also encoded in... Um, um, holy in Bible, actually. <clears throat> holy equals uh, 12 and Bible equals 16 and 12 times 16 is 192. So the same number that you find, 105, you find in um, Holy Bible. So, all right. If anybody would like to support the fine work that we do here at Gnostic Church and Academy, you can, um, you can support us by... Uh, Venmo, buy me a coffee, cash app, or you can become a good bird at subscribe star. And we also do, um, we also do, if anybody wants to send a donation or just a letter or anything like that, um, you can make uh, checks payable to Kevin McNally and 2550 South New Court, Monroe, Wisconsin, 53566. And hey, let's play a little tune quick. Why not? <laughs> So thank you all, thank you to all the people that do support the fine work that we do here at the Gnostic Academy. We really appreciate it, and we hope that we we hope that you uh, learn enough that you actually teach your children these things because it's really important that they no longer get that indoctrination, education that they be getting at the at the schoolings. Um, even even Waldorf school and things like that is not going to be teaching your children this. Okay, so you know. Um, I just say it. I, I think that we provide a pretty good service when it comes to that sort of thing. So anyway, so thank you all the people that do support. We really appreciate it. We, we love you very much. Let's look at that arm. Okay? Let's look at that hand that extends onto the arm that gives us that ratio of phi, right? You can even see there. What is the, what is the Egyptians showing there? They're, they're highlighting things. In, just in how this is, you know, it's like, look. I'm giving you this cubit. Look at his hands are not symmetrical either. It's like two, two, what is it? It's two left hands or whatever. Pretty interesting. But then even there, you can even see it's like, oh, look, I'm, I'm showing you the palm here. We just looked at mathematics of the hands, 105, 210. They gave us lunar numbers, both of them. 105, 210, both of those things can point directly to lunar numbers. There's no question about that. Okay, what we're going to see is your entire arm does this as well. It's not just the phalanges of your hands and things like that. So that same arm that you, that, that cubit, right, that's based off that proportion of phi. Remember when we said five and five and five and five and then five and then five and five and five, 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 all that sort of, and then we found that that five gave us that proportion of 1.618. That's the cubit. That's the measurement of the cubit. That's on your arm. And the reason that it's, that that measurement was considered sacred even in Revelation, it talks about measuring the city of God with the cubit is because it's based on what? Human beings. It's based on the proportion of the human beings. There it is, 1 to 1.618 approximately. It's always, you know, that approximate. So let's look at the numbers, just the straight numbers given to us by your, your, your hands and then your, you know, the rest of your arm here. 
13 bones in the hand, 14 phalanges on your fingers and your and your thumb, okay? So number one, when you look at a, a lunar a lunar month, a lot of times it's it's calculated in 28 days, and we'll we'll get into that in just a second. But so just in the phalanges, it's like the the pattern of the moon as it goes from new to new, and it goes through all those phases and waning and waxing and crescent and gibbous and all that sort of shit, right? It goes it gets to a point where it's about halfway in its cycle. As we'll see, that halfway point is about 14 days, and that's exactly what you have on your hands. 14 and 14, and then the halfway point of the moon is roughly between them, okay? This bone here is called your radius. That's a mathematical term. The bone that it leads to all that math tells you about geometry. Just saying, just saying. Then the other bone that's attached to that bone, radius that's right next to it, that's called lun or that's called your ulna. I put Luna there just so you'd see. It's, a, it's actually called your ulna, bo ulna bo bone, right? Ulna is an anagram for Luna. So Ulna, Luna, your radius, your moon bone, your ulna. And I th actually, I think the etymology is L, like it's because it, re it referenced L bow. So it's like Ul is a reference to L and then bow is, but basically, but you know, it's Ulna, Luna. There's your, there's your moon. A bunch of math about the moon on your hands. And then right next to that is another term for math, okay? There's your sidereal lunar month. Length of time it takes the moon to return to the given star in the sky is roughly 27.3 days. And then there's a different point with the synodic lunar month, and that's the length between, that's the actual cycle of the moon. So the sidereal is basically, hey, where is it? How many, how long does it take to get back to this certain star in the sky? Roughly 27.3 days. The synodic lunar month, 29.53 the moon is very tricky. It's not like, it doesn't work like clockwork, okay? It's, I mean, it does, but the the sun works as like a one, two, three, right? It's 24 hours, 24 hours. The moon is doing all sorts of crazy shit. And this is really the, the, the unity of opposites in creation. The perfectly timed sun and the crazy ass moon. And you have to merge those two and, you know, essentially realize where they came from. God Almighty. So... Those two times right there, number seven, number one, just looking at the whole numbers, 29, okay, when it's just whole numbers, that's the number of bones total in your, in your arm. 14 phalanges, 13, 27 total on your hand. Well, that's the, that's the base number of your sidereal lunar month. Once again, we, you don't count 0. 0.3 bones. You don't count 0. 0.53 phalanges. It's the whole numbers always. Okay, so we're relating whole numbers to things that can't be essentially related to whole numbers or the closest we can get to whole numbers, of course, right? Because we're mapping and tracking something that doesn't work in whole numbers like the sun. So uh, 13 bones, 14 bones, and then your radius and your luna. All the, your, in other words, your phi, your cubit tells you what? 29, which is what? It also tells you 27 and 29. And then also gives you the two hands, give you 28. Those are all lunar numbers. Those are all lunar numbers. And we are, so 27.3 in 29.53, if you just find the, you know, the average between them in whole numbers, you're going to get roughly 28. And that's your phalanges of your hands. Okay? So not only did 105 and 210 give us all a bunch of lunar numbers, your entire arm does as well. Whether that's 27, 28, 29, luna or ulna and your radius... See what's going on here? The radius is the radius is the staff, stake, rod, spoke of wheel, ray of light, a beam of light, radius of a circle. You're a beam of light, if you will. Inner bone of the forearm, the ulna, the elbow is basically what it is. El, elena, whatever. Um, but yeah, anagram for Luna. This is the other thing that's on, and once again, this is a review for some people, but uh, I just want to show this because it's, it basically goes to show you how perf, you know, how uh, exquisitely designed you are, right? The when you when you actually you know, um, like in a woman's impregnation cycle or whatever, like your menstrual cycle, right? That that, that has a per, that's a periodicity, right? It's called your period, right? The first day of a woman's period is taken as the starting point of the cycle, and if the cycle is a twenty-eight day cycle, it's usually roughly twenty-eight days, twenty-eight twenty-nine days. 
once again, why this cycle is often related to the moon, then the 14th day after the period is estimated to be the ovulation. So there's a point where the egg drops in the, 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 you know, the, the, the womb of the, the woman, and this is the optimum time to get pregnant. This is when ovulation happens, right? When the ovum the, drops in, and that's when the woman can get pregnant. This happens on roughly the 14th day. That math is given to you on your hands. It's there's the ovulation you can even see it's zero to twenty it's zero to twenty eight roughly about twenty eight days period and then half in between that is when the egg drops. It's like you know, where where's like, I mean, are they teaching this at like Harvard and Yale and shit like that? Are they teaching this anywhere? And it's basic, you know, it's math that you know. Can you count to seven? You can triangulate to seven. You can figure this out. All of this stuff has been placed right in front of you so that you not only you could see, oh, there is order even to like how, how when the egg drops that a woman is allowed to get pregnant. But not only that, this order from right up here to my arm to very counting the phalanges to measuring it to the sun. What is it? It's all based on the proportion that you are an exquisite anthropogasm. You're an exquisite microcosm of the macrocosm. You, don't, you can't come into this creation without dealing with this math. There's your 13th uh, lunar, 13 uh, month cycle. 13 times 28 is 364. That's a lunar calendar that's been used all over the world. We've talked numerous times about this. This is something that the Anishinaabe used to talk about, that they actually had a 13, uh, this is one of the calendars that the Anishinaabe, which the Anishinaabe are like a part of the, Oh, we'll go into this a little bit when we do the Ojibwe, but basically they were a tribe that was like of the north, basically where we were up in um, Wisconsin. They were up there in Canada and that sort of thing. And um, I actually learned this from an Anishinaabe elder. He told me this specifically. He said that the, they had the calendar. It was a 1328-day lunar calendar, and they actually used that calendar, and that they based it off um, the 13. He didn't know the 28 because I was the one that actually, and that's why he was like, oh, wow, this right in front of you. But he said the 13 actually came from what would be called the, they're not joints. I know this is the wrong terminology, but would be considered your neck joints so, or your, your the, the sections of your body, I should say, the, the divisions of your body. So your neck, your two shoulders, your elbows, your hips, your your uh, your wrists, your knee joints, and your ankles. And I know they're not called necessarily joints, but there was this is what they said were the divisions of the body is 13 and 28. It's a matrix of 13, 28, Okay. And all of that, once again, is basically us looking at the cosmic order and relating ourselves to that cosmic order. That's all it is. And this is the question that we always have to ask when we look out into the wonderment of heaven and we look at those stars and that galaxy and all those lights that are flying everywhere and all this other shit. It's like, what is any of that stuff? No one has an answer other than metaphysical truths, you know, celestial objects which convey an, a divine order. That's what they are, right? And so we have to ask, what relationship do we have with these heavenly lights? Well, once again, as I always say, the only thing that we can really do that we can verify is to map, track, and count them. And that's the that's one of the, I mean, we could see their colors. We could see, you know, maybe they give us a certain feeling. Maybe they blink or whatever. But none, all of those things are a good portion of the things that a lot of people extract from the, you know, their their philosophies on the those those are all unprovable things. A, a lot of those things are unprovable. Of course, c colors are not. But the point I'm making is the only thing that we can prove about those things is that what they have an order, they have a cycle, and that we can map and track those those cycles. What other um, creature on this on this plane can do that? There 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 is no other one as far as we know. Okay. No, no, see, te ipsum. I think this is how you base. Basically, this is a know thyself kind of thing. This is actually um, um, this is going to get us into this a little segue into the next section here. This gets uh, this is from a a Freemasonic, I forget a pamphlet or something like that. And basically, what we'll look at this thing. You, I mean, the, this this is it right there. That's that's pretty much all you need to know. Right there. That's so. You got the sun and the moon. You got the two pillars. You got the opposites. You got the man and the woman. You've got them holding hands, lifting up. You know, I, I, it looks like a. I'm not sure what that is. The, but the woman's holding a serpent. It's like a Pythia kind of thing, if you will, right? And then you've got the the, the dove. We all know this symbolism now, right? On the very top, what do you have? Oh, it looks like a number five. Looks like a very very fiish kind of thing, right? 
this whole this whole thing in alchemy would be considered the alchemical androgyne, and it's the merging of opposites, okay? And that's really what this is all about when we look at the hands, okay? I'm not going to get into this too much. This is just to lead to this next segment to actually help us understand, once again, when we want to know ourselves, we have to know our surroundings. We have to know our cosmos. We have to know where we are. One of the things that the alchemical androgyne, or the, the which was is considered the completion of the great work, it's basically you know the alchemical wedding, the alchemical marriage, is telling us about this essentially dualism that comes from what a singularity. The dualism is ultimately born. It's not even dualistic, right? It would just be the appearance of dualistic in this in this sense, right? It ultimately comes from the one grand divine order. This is the mono, monotheism. So. But it helps us understand that alchemical androgyne that the you know that we are split, that man is split. Once again, when we we want to come to know ourselves, we have to look at ourselves and just you know what, how are we formed? Okay, we did a bunch of math. We looked at the math of our arms, our hands, and all this other stuff, right? Just how are we formed? Look at this. You know, you're completely symmetrical. Symmetry itself is is a is a um, it's a evidence, or I would even say evidence. In, in one sense, I would say it's proof of design. It's a, it's a, it's a proof of design. It's proof that there's an order. Because if there was, if it was all just chaos, chaos, why would the, why would the entirety of the creation itself, with the living creatures, decide to always use this mirror symmetry sort of thing? It wouldn't. It would just be like, oh, just random. No, it shows that there's an order. Cycles themselves show that there's an order. We'll get to that. So symmetry says, to, in, in one sense, shows you that there's a, a designer, that there's a creator, okay? Now look at yourself, two eyes, two ears, two nostrils, the hemispheres of your brain. Even if you can't see the occulted inner nature of yourself, you can still look in the exterior and see what's going on. Symmetry, S teeth, they're, they're divided, even the 32, right? Those are all, you know, dual, dividing numbers. Two nostrils, right? Hands, shoulders, breasts, hips, legs, everything is divided. The only thing that's not is what? Think about the things that are not divided on you. Your penis has two balls, but it has one shaft, and that one shaft goes into one vagina. And that, and that all, what does that do? That procreates, that creates new human beings, which is all based on the ovulation period that's on your hands. The only two things that are singular, I don't want to say the only two things, but exterior and the exterior realm the only two things that are singular in themselves are what the vagina and the penis and those are the two things that actually bring you into the material world you could say the mouth is you know it's one mouth or whatever but even the mouth is split you can even do the split split let you know the tongue there's a split there right penis yes the balls that sort of thing but the vagina not so the the, the, the two things the vagina and the penis that bring you into creation are singular and the rest of you are what symmetrical the symmetry the symmetry and then tells us what now once again we've talked about this numerous numerous times it's it's a, it's the um it's what eventually everyone's just going to have to come to recognize in order to really understand who you are and where you are it's the it's the truth that everyone shares it's what's commonsensical and that is everything above you is metaphysical. Everything, the clouds, the sun, the moon, all those stars. Everything is metaphysical. It's, it's incorruptible. You can't touch it. You can't move it. You're not going to mess with any of the cycles. You're not going to move Sirius from its, you know, you're not going to move Polaris from its throne. You're not going to make the sun go, you know, 372 days in a, in a year. No, nope, none of that is up to you at all. That's what's above you. Everybody experiences that the same way. And this is why NASA and JAXA and ESA and all those other bullshit space organizations are trying to tell you that it's physical up there. We went to the moon. We were driving cars on Mars. Because they want to mess with your actual experience and where you are. Everything above you, this is your split, if you will, right? That ultimately comes from one God. The spirit above and the, the earth below. The heaven above, the earth below. Everything below here is physical. It's known. It's corruptible. It's corporeal. It's the material realm. Everything above you is spiritual. Everybody experiences this the same way. Everybody. Even the liars at NASA. No, they didn't actually go up there and flying around on an ISS. And they didn't go and drive cars on Mars because, or, you know, on the moon or whatever because you can't do that. Okay? This, to know thyself, is also to know when we want to actually proportion ourselves to the cosmic order, we got to understand that cosmic order. 
Well, there's a there's a dual a, a, a inherent dualism that exists there. Once again, is it dualistic? No, because in the beginning, God, the Almighty One, singular source of all love and and form and creation, created what the heaven and the earth, the spirit and the material. Okay, you have to know your cosmos in order to understand that that cosmos is within you, and that's what the Vitruvian Man is all about. You are made from that cosmic order. Once again. Most people would see it's like, oh, that's so beautiful. It's just such a nice philosophy. As above, so below. Blah. No, 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 no. There's a bunch of math to that. There's proofs to show you. You know? You ever hear that old, um, it's like Jonathan Edwards. It's like sinners in the hands of an angry God. And it's this whole like sermon that this guy did in like 1780 or some shit. I forget when it was. But he's basically talking about how God is just pissed off at everybody. And he just left us as this worm hanging over this abyss. And we have no answers to our predicaments. And we should just feel shitty about ourselves and stuff like that. That's all goddamn nonsense. All of it. All of that. All A lot of that stuff that you get taught at the church and constantly and in you know, fear and guilt and all this other stuff. It's like, no, God actually wants you to understand the perfection in which he's created you with. And he's put that all over you. How you're formed, the mathematics of your hands, the proportions of your body, how, you're, how, you're, how you interact with the sun, how to map and even track time. You, we, didn't, we, weren't la- we weren't put as worms cast into abyss with just no answers to our predicament whatsoever. No, 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 no. That's not the Gnostic perspective because you have to come to know thyself. And then you'll find out that that's all goddamn nonsense, as we like to say. So there's your sun and moon. There's your masculine and feminine. There's, that's, your, that's your division. It's very pious. You're, it's like you're a big pie. I'm just saying. So... Once again, coming to know your cosmology, coming to know yourself is is being honest and being forthright about where you are and about what you actually experience. No, you're not spinning. No one's ever felt the earth spin because the earth isn't spinning. That sun, you it looks like it's traveling above you because it is, right? It's, it's, it's all of these sorts of things. God gave you all the tools necessary for you to understand your predicament and, and what you're doing here. Right and understand how you know perfect this place is designed, and that ultimately leads you to the purpose. Okay, um, and so you know we are a flat Earth church because that's where that's that's what we're you know we we want to be honest about our where we are, and this is the sense that's common to all people. Okay, that's where that's where we live. We want to know ourselves. We can't lie about where we are. Then we're not going to actually know know ourselves. So, that's beautiful, isn't it? Okay. Common sense are the senses that are common to all. So when we, when we seek our common sense, when we seek our rationale and our reason and that sort of stuff, if there's nothing more reasonable, number one, than all the math that was just provided to you, Right? It's triangulation 14 and 20 and the teeth and the proportions of the hands, all of it, right? All of that stuff is verifiable. When we look at our relationship to the cosmos, we have to be honest about it. Those things that our common sense tells us exactly where we are. Are we spinning? No. No, no, we're not, we're not spinning. No one's ever felt the earth spin. Are we tilted? No, I don't know. I don't think so. It seems like we're in a flat stationary plane, right? right. What's above us? It's all metaphysical. No one's ever touched the sun. No one's ever touched the moon. No one's ever touched Venus in a physical body. Those, that's all metaphysical. And until we come to that recognition, we'll be lost because we won't actually know ourselves. Okay? Um, the, 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 when we talk about that 24-hour period that we, you know, when we talk about symmetry as being a proof of design, that, you know, we can proportion ourselves off, the, you know, to, our, to the sun and actually map and track its periodicity on ourselves and things like that all of these things are proof of, proofs of design that's what they are and all of these things have been given to us and we're supposed to you know as human beings actually ask the tough questions and actually come to um you know bring all of this knowledge together and the preponderance of all the evidence and the proofs and recognize that oh no this this no this is uh this is perfect and we are made perfect and and um you know the the knowledge to actually recognize that that we are proportioned off the whole thing is is actually really beautiful and and magical. 
But God wants you to do a little math. It's true. No getting around it. This cycle, number one, that you see, that we see, is like, what is all that stuff? I have no idea. But you know what that cycle is? That cycle is, it's a, it's a proof of design. This is what we've said so many times. Simple things like that. The thing that, you know, we have a son that does it, that's just constantly doing this. And then this, this son is doing this, right? And then this moon is doing this other thing. And they're still, and they're, they're totally in alignment. There's, you know, there's, there's, the sun and the moon are not crashing into each other or anything like that. And then the Venus is doing its thing. And then Mars is doing its thing. And all of those cycles, the cycle, the Milky Way going, it's all constantly in motion, constantly doing what it's doing. It hasn't stopped as far as we know. It's always been this way. And that circle, that cycle itself is living proof of design. Okay. Once again, when we pattern those things off our hands, we realize that you know we're a reflection of that design. Something once again, this is this is the key to some of the esoteric, you know esoteric mysteries is to locate that that God that exists within. Right. When we come to know ourselves, we have to realize what's the other thing that we know when we look at the heaven and the earth and things like that. Well, we come to know ourselves like, well, this is uh, this is temporary. Marty's only going to be around for maybe 72, 80 years, hopefully longer. I don't know. We'll see. But uh, he's not going to be around forever. So in order to know thyself, do you really identify just with this external thing? That you, and Then you're not really knowing yourself. You have to actually go within and actually find out what, what, is the, what is the thing that is eternal. That's what you have to come to know. This is the six around. This is coordinates, math, to point to that thing. And it's given you all and all over in, in esoterica. There's just no question about it. You can't go to the Mogan David without seeing it. You can't go to the Seed of Life without seeing it. You can't go to the Chi Ro without seeing it. You can't go to the Menorah without seeing it. You can't go into the halls of the Freemasonic lodges and actually get into their study and be honest with it and not see it. Okay? We've talked all day long about the fact that in order to point that Sabbath day to that, that, that son of man, that Christ that exists within you, which is what we're getting to right now, because that's really coming to know yourself. A lot of math to get to ultimately to point to what? Something that's metaphysical, that's actually beyond physicality, beyond math. The Sabbath day, the son of man, the Christ within. How many times do we have to go into that Bible and then going to the exact same thing? That center point that gives you that life, right? This is what Gnosticism is all about, is releasing that, is, is recognizing what that is, that eternal, that pulse, the thing that beats your heart. That is the, that is the, the, the drum of uh, God himself, you know, boom, 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 within you, right? And that thing is eternal, it never dies. This thing is fleeting, it's passing, it's going to go away. But that doesn't die. And that's what the Gnostic approach that's what the that's what Gnosticism is all about is to get you into that knowledge and to get to that center. Ultimately, why am I bringing this up? Because that center is the balance point with within you, as we'll see. But it's also found what with six around one is the magical number seven. That's why the the whole universe in Genesis is based six around one, six days resting on a seventh. <clears throat> it's gonna take some math. To find that center in that center is of you ultimately is what is what is understood as your heartbeat okay and this is really what when you come to know yourself what, what you'll what you'll find is that you are that eternal spark you are that I am the Gnostic held, held, the Gnostics held that the essential nature of the human is divine and that's true they look upon men and women as gods and goddesses who have forgotten who they are that's pretty much true it's from the predicament, it's from this predicament that the Gnostic aspires to be freed by Gnosis. And Gnosis is the knowledge ultimately of who you are, where you came from, what you're doing here. Ultimately, Gnosis is nothing more than understanding the will of God, period. That's it. That's it. When we understand, when we extract this mathematics, who determined that mathematics? God. So what are we doing? We're understanding his will. That's what he willed in the sky. You can't change it. I can't change it. Ain't nobody going to change it. What are we doing? We're coming to that knowledge. We're trying to understand it so we can understand our relationship to the Almighty. He's beating that drum in your in your heart. That's what he's doing. This is why he's understood. So that that thing, that's God in you. 
Gnostics seek to hear the music of the chief musician. Because that's why he's called the chief musician, right? He's to, it's, to, it's Gnostics seek to dance to the pulse or the heartbeat of the cosmos. Because after all the math and all the geometry and all the proportionality and all this other stuff, what is it ultimately leading to? You? Leading to, as we always talk about, that heart, the sacred heart of Christ. Why is he a chief musician? Why is God considered this, you know, the, this, I, this notion or is given this sort of um, metaphor of a chief musician? What does a musician do, right? It's, you know, there's harmonies, songs, that sort of thing. What are those spheres doing? They're playing their ballads out in the sky, that sort of stuff. But also, what is he doing? He's beating the beating the pounding of the drum in your heart. And this is why the Pythagoreans, this is why lots of ancient, like, you know, or just mystical traditions, if you will, esoteric traditions talked about the harmony of the spheres. It's basically that, that this, was a, this was a song. This was a, the, the grand melody that God was playing out. Okay? So the point is, is coming when we go six around one, which once again, where do we find that seven to, to, lo to do this in general? It's on your hands and your feet. The triangulation of it has been put on your hands and your feet. All of this is to find that center, that center point. And that center point is ultimately balance. Okay? And that's, once again, this is ultimately what the Gnostic knows what he's here to do. Balance will always be restored here. Balance is, this is how this place works. The sun and the moon, the balance. The man and the woman, the balance, right? The, the spirit and the matter are balanced ultimately down here. Our quest is to recognize the interplay of good and evil that happens here and always go towards God, as we talk about, is to always seek that higher balance. This is what you'll find at the key, at the, at the foundation of all of these ancient traditions is these basic principles. It doesn't matter if you go Cherokee or you go freaking Egyptology or you go Buddha or you go Christianity. You're going to find the same message. Why? Because that message is intrinsic. It's inherent within the creation. It doesn't come from some dusty old fucking religious book. It comes right from you. To the traditional Cherokee, the concept of balance is central in all aspects of social and ceremonial life. In this belief system, women balance men just as summer balance winter, plants balance animals, and farming balance hunting. Okay? When we talk about... Um, oh, let's do this here. The, um, the triangle. Okay? Talk about you... Have the trine, remember? 120 right there. And then 180, the triangle, th that's manifesting right in your hands. Wait, it's on your feet as well. Whoa, wait a second, what's going on? We've got a triangle upstairs, triangle down there. Okay, what is the triangle, the geometry of it? The triangle is the spiritual axiom of balance perfected in form. It's, it's, a, it's a perfectly balanced polygon, okay? Hence why, hence why all these trinities across the world. Why is Christ... Rep represented as a trinity because he's all over he's all up in your business you got christ here and then you got christ here and then you're the you know when we, we seek that center what do we find we're trying to find that balance okay what's in that center as we always talk about going beyond the math now it's your heart it's the pulse of your heart let's listen to manly palmer hall a second okay does the pulse this mysterious drumming of the gods actually originate in the heart or is it communicated to the heart? Is the so-called beating of the heart something innate and intrinsic in this muscle or has it another cause? And is the circulation of the blood due to the action of the heart? Or is the action of the heart due to the circulation of the blood? Now this would present uh, a series of problems that uh, could easily become very confused and probably would be regarded with the gravest suspicion by men of science. Yet the fact remains that it is not at all inconceivable that the heart is what it has always been believed to be in the worlds of religion and philosophy, not a source of the vitalizing or activation of the body, but a focal point for energy of a peculiar and particular kind, which is in some way imparted to the heart and therefore is capable of being separated from the heart by the process of death. 
Is the death of the body a death of energy or a separation of energy? The focal point which we call consciousness was actually placed in the heart. <clears throat> is that ball is that is that uh, that pulse, that beating of the heart, does it come from within the heart itself? Is that just a muscle that all of a sudden it just dies out eventually? Or is that pulse, that beat, where does that actually come from? The esotericists and the, re the religious people would say that that beating of the heart comes straight from the Almighty. And that, of course, we know that we want to liberate that from this material vessel and bring that pounding, that, that beating of that drum right back up to heaven and play the songs, you know, the harpers harping with their harps, if you will, kind of thing. All of that math, all of this math, 28, 27, 105, 105, 210, all of 384, about three, you know, all of that sort of stuff, sexagesimal system, all of the six around one, right? all of that stuff is ultimately there to lead you to the center. The riddle is to find the middle. The riddle is to find the middle. And that's what all of these things are doing. You're symmetrical so you can find the balance. You're given the perfected, the, the 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 spiritual the geometric spiritual axiom of, of balance in and you know in form you're given that on your hands because God wants you to find that and not just on some stupid math on your hands but actually find it in your spiritual body and this is where the the seven chakras come from what's always in the center the heart we know that the heart the red and blue is the circulation of the blood through the heart. It's the, um, you know, of course, it, the red and blue is also the, the, the light spectrum, as we know. Okay, so we're trying to find the, the middle of the red and blue, if you will. The merging of the red and blue, which is purple. It's a royal color. But the heart is most often illustrated with the colors red and blue to signify the outgoing and incoming blood or the distinguishing, uh, distinguishing aspect of the bloods being oxygenation and deoxygenation, of course. Okay, so this center, this center beating of the heart, at the end of this day, all this math leads to is ultimately to come to know yourself. And what is that? As we just said, what is that thing that's pumping? Is that Kevin McNally? Is that Marty Leeds? Is that Claudia Pavonis? No. That? That's God. Right within you. Beating his drum. That's Emmanuel. That's God with us. He's always with us. It is a bond that may never be broken. Once you realize that you're completely intertwined with the entire connection that you're proportioned to the whole thing that you're made in his image you realize that god wouldn't go through all of that and then just leave you cast off like that sinners in the hang hands of an angry god john edwards no he was going to put himself right in the center of you it is a bond that may never be broken always with us god is always with us may never be severed and the only way it may and can be lost is if man himself forgoes forgets or abandons this innate knowledge that's what's happened, I think, in our current time, is that uh, we've abandoned this. No religion or belief system has a monopoly on this absolute undying truth. Amen. The word transcends any written word. Amen. Uh, it is the living word that is written in our hearts in the grand book of life. Amen. The heart is where the epistle has been written. Amen. The mystery of our creation starts with man, and the answer to that mystery is revealed within man. Within him, within you, exists the immortal and undying divine spark and illumination of the Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to know yourself, you have to know, ultimately, that fireplace, that heat, that heart. What is the, what is the symbol of fire, heat, fire? It's a triangle. It's an upright perfectly balanced triangle that heat you have to know that heat that heart you have to know the hearth the fireplace the hearth the heart is the fireplace is the hearth and what is that that's where god beating his drum how do we find that we have to humble ourselves we and when you humble yourselves there's nothing there you know when you when you get to the let me just say this. When we did the whole um, Disney Sword in the Stone, what was, you know, ultimately the wart there, the little wart, the little runt, Arthur there, 
He pulled that sword from the stone. He did the, the thing that no other, no other warrior could possibly do. And how did he do it? He will seek the sword with a humble heart and not for himself alone. He took the sword because Kay needed one. He, this other guy, his brother needed one. He didn't do anything for his own glory. And this is what the weighing of the heart is all about. What do you think all of that means? You don't need to know Egyptology. You don't need to know who Anubis frickin' is. You don't need to know who Horus is. You don't need to know what the 42 generations or the 42 principles of the Egyptian march. You don't need to know the Ennead gods of Egyptology. You don't need to be studied in the ancient ascended masters of the enlightened path. What do you have to know? Yourself. And what's it going to teach you about? What's, what, when you know thyself, what is yourself teach you about? That you need to be balanced. You need to seek the center of your heart. And that you are perfectly crafted. You are a perfect representation of the entire thing. And this this is what this is what Christianity is all about. I'm gonna finish with this. This comes from a guy named what's his name? John Polsford, I think. Now, whoever thus searches into himself is constrained to search after the living God. Unless a man is under the influence and control of his inner and diviner nature, he inevitably leads a life and acts a part which degrades and ruins him. God, the father of his spirit, is infinitely averse to this, which he has most affectingly grown or shown and proved by that great mystery of love, God manifest in man's flesh. Bethlehem, Calvary, Mount Olive, simply means God's infinite concern for man's redemption. If Christ's ascension does not signify the possibility of man's ascension to God in the angel world, it signifies nothing. To be destitute of self-knowledge is, strictly speaking, to be destitute of all true and right knowledge. If we know not ourselves, nor the end of our being, we shall fall into many foolish and hurtful snares and mistake the value of everything. We shall take appearances and sophistries for truth and regard God's truth as dreams. And worse than all, we shall misuse ourselves, thinking we are wise and we are foolish, and that we are doing well when we are perishing. For we may take every possible care of the corruptible body of our flesh while we are destroying the health and happiness of the precious inner man. Self-knowledge will inspire more than dignity and self-respect. It will inspire awe and a sublime hope. There will be no self-adulation in this knowledge. Let me say that again. There will be no self-adulation in this knowledge. I don't even put my name on my books, by the way, just so you know. On the contrary, self-knowledge is always associated with sweet, restful, childlike humility. For right self-knowledge recognizes the infinite Father Spirit to be alone, great, and worshipful. We all share in divinity. That is the one great human inheritance. To claim direct relationship to the infinite spirit is not presumptuous. Our Father, which art in heaven. And the one tremendous thought is that our divine birthright is for eternity. The everlasting Christ, as the ideal of our own humanity, is not only revealed to us, but the breath of his power is within us as well. That comes from John Polsford. And I would like to say, um, I think he's a pretty good bird. I think you guys are pretty good birds too. And I think that's going to do it for today. Thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate everybody that steps by and um, enjoys the services and spreads the love and spreads these. So we would like this church to grow. And we can't grow without the good birds. You know what I'm saying? You can be good birds. So if you'd like to become a good bird, you can become a good bird at Subscribe Star. You can become a Phoenix bird, an Aquila bird, a Cygnus bird. Or if you want to give 77 77 a month, you can become Dime of the Pete Ma bird. And we appreciate all the people that are subscribed uh signed up at subscribe star and do um you know that do weekly tithings and things like that is what keeps us going and we would like to keep going because we we love doing this so um any donations venmo buy me a coffee cash app um that is uh, or, you, or you can become a good bard okay uh snail mail uh, Kevin McNally, N2550, Southview Court, Monroe, Wisconsin, 53566. I want to say thank you to Content Safe. You guys have been killing it. You get me on BitChute, Rumble, Odyssey, and all those places since we always have issues because we are technological neophytes. We're idiots when it comes to this shit. Anyway, uh, Flatter Sun, Moon, and Zodiac app. Get the app. 
tells you about your flat stationary Earth. You want to know yourself, you're going to have to know your cosmos. It's a good way to do it. Um, and then, of course, oh, let's see. I'm also doing the gathering. We're doing the gathering um, 18th through the 21st, Kuyama Valley. And uh, it's going to be great. Looking Really looking forward to it. Um, and a bunch of great musicians. Five times August, Zuby, Head Flux, uh, Traveler, Mike Winter is going to be DJing. Uh, as far as the speakers, me, Kelly Brogan, Amanda Vollmer, Bear, Bear Lando. Uh, a bunch of really great people. It's going to be awesome. And also, Flat Toberfest. October 21st and 23rd, or 22nd, 2023. We really hope we're going to be there. I did I did just speak to Stephen Carpenter, Steph of the Deftones. Totally cool guy. The guy is great. Had a great conversation. We should have spoke more about Flat Earth, but we got into guitars, and I'm a guitar nut, so that's just kind of where the conversation went. But uh, it was great, so if you get a chance, check out that. If you get a chance, go to flattoberfest.com. Flat Earth Festivals is the other. Flatearthfestivals.com is the other one. Um, church Store if you'd like to support the work we do. Okay, that's going to do it. Guys, thank you so much. May you always keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ onto eternal life. May his grace be with you all. Amen. Okay, that's going to do it for me. Um, I will see you. Uh, we didn't do Tuesdays with Marty because once again, we had internet issues. We were supposed, I had it all, I had everything set up and we spent like a half hour, 45 minutes and for some reason, restream wouldn't work and I don't know what it is, but it was a total pain in the ass. So frustrating. So we didn't do Tuesdays with Marty last time. We will do it, um, or you know, we'll be a lot more coming up in the future here. So we'll try to keep on that. So all right, that's gonna do it for me, guys. As always, thank you for being here. Uh, really appreciate it. Okay. As always, many blessings and much love to all.